All right, the truth about, again, the blessings of being hu humble. Everyone say, I'm humble. <laughs> Isn't that hard to say? Amen. How many's ever caught yourself not being so humble? Don't raise your hands. And how many's caught yourself being over humbled? All right, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to show you that the way in which God promotes a brother or sister or one of his children is through us being humble. Can you say amen? You see, a humble person doesn't judge others. You see, a humble person loves to learn from the word of God because God knows more than any of us put together. A humble person loves to be corrected because every correction points out how they can improve. You see, a non-humble person would always take offense. Would sit in a sermon maybe like this, and if it gets a little pointy, they'll go, I'm offended, I won't return. You see, but a humble person, God says, will inherit the earth. Because the word meek also means humble. Meek is not weak, it's humble. So there's a key to what we need to know in our walk that we can be confidently humble before God. And you know what happens? It says God will exalt us in due season. So the best way for you to get promoted in the kingdom, God promotes everyone, is for us to stay humble and needy to God. Someone say amen. All right, so let's get into this. Good morning, church, family of the living God. Linda and I pray that you prosper and be in health. We've been constantly, daily, we pray for you. That's not a brag. It's something we do because I happen to really care for you, and my wife cares for you too. So welcome to this. We'll call it a briefing today. Welcome to today's briefing. Let's uh, look at exactly what God wants to tell us in the word but did you bring ears to hear? Amen. Jesus walked about. Maybe they didn't have ears back then, Jerry. <laughs> you got ears to hear, you know. How many know that it, it's a real temptation to when you're nervous to talk a lot? I know it is for me. I got, my dad says, I know one thing that you got from God. I says, Dad, what's that? He says, the gift of gab. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you, Father. Amen. So I had a great dad. I don't know, some of you might have known him. Some of you don't, but he was a wonderful father. He would say things like this, go get the belt. We have a learning time. <laughs> All right, so you're with me. So in this briefing, let's put ears on to hear. Let's desire to understand the word of God as the Holy Spirit takes us into specifics. Now let me explain this again. The, the word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, gives us a general guidance and direction for our lives. Read the book of Proverbs. Ladies are in the book of Proverbs on Friday. And you t read some Proverbs a day, you know, and you'll see how to line yourself up. So the Word of God is a general guidance system for us to line ourselves up with the Word. Can you say amen? And you know, of course, now, the difference between the Old Testament and the New. Always read the Old in light of having Jesus in you and applying what you see in the scripture in the Old Testament to your life in Christ, not to your life without Christ, all right? Then, though, we need specifics. How many know that God tells you to go into all the world, but how many know that God wants to give you a specific instruction? So my, God might say in the word, go visit your neighbor, but as I go, the Holy Spirit says, and do this, do this, and do this. So I got the general guidance of God's word to reach out to others and to love others and pray for others. But when, as I do, the Holy Spirit has the right to guide us specifically on the how-tos. Amen? The whens. How many know there's timing before God? And you know, there's this urgency a lot of times. I don't know if you've caught it, but it seems like the older I get, my body wants to hurry up. Why do I want to hurry up? <laughs> especially when I don't need to. You see that? I think the enemy does that. Our, you know, we're going to miss out. We don't hurry up. We don't make it happen, you know. And so what the Lord wants us to do is learn the key to the power of being humble, 
how that God promotes and exalts the humble. Say, that's me. Amen. So go with me to Luke 18, please. What we need and understand is mankind is a fallen being. So you are three things, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is where God dwells when you're born again. You ask God to come into your heart. Your spirit, okay? You have a soul. That's all your personality, your mind, your will, your emotions, your appetite. And you live in a nurse suit, a body. We've done a lot of teaching of it. So what you need to understand is this scripture, okay, is beginning to talk to us about in our flesh, doesn't matter what we do, from our flesh, and I have to explain this, it all has pride in it. Now, when Adam and Eve fell, what happened? Sin in their hearts, right? Sin came into their hearts. But you know what else came in? The devil. Now, think about this. I'm going to just teach you. God gave all the works of his hands to Adam and Eve, didn't he? Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And when Adam turned over and committed high treason and gave it over to the devil, sin entered man and Satan's nature entered man because... Mankind had control of the earth. Now what happened is a switch. Adam gave what God gave him over to the enemy. And the enemy gave his nature, his rebellion, his flesh, his pride over to Adam. And so when you and I, I know if you've heard this a lot, but we need to understand. When you and I take it upon ourselves to walk our own walk and do our own thing, it releases pride, whether we know it or not. It's kind of like you when, when you, after three or four days and you don't take a shower, you know you need a shower. <laughs> you know, let's hope that you do it every day. Well, if you don't saturate yourself with God on a daily basis, your flesh produces pride. And here's the key. We're going to see it later. The spirit resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So whenever we act out of our own self, out of anger, out of frustration, we are also releasing pride. And pride pushes the Holy Spirit away. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave you. It's just quenched and pushed aside because now... We, I'm talking about myself. Now I rose up and I'm doing my own thing for God. Look at your neighbor and say, don't do your own thing for God. Do his thing for you. See the difference? Saints and master are getting those horses behind the cart to push. To push. It's not getting done fast enough, so we'll push it a little bit. Now I'm talking to you because... We want to learn about humility. We want to know what exactly it is. Now, you get a chance in, in your studies. You go to Matthew chapter 5, and you look at the Beatitudes. Those are the attitudes to be. Okay, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Beatitudes where Jesus is teaching his disciples on the multitude. One thing he taught was he taught how to strip yourself of yourself and how to build Allow God to build up the godliness inside of you. So when you read Matthew chapter 5, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that, um, that uh, are meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then it goes down. The stripping away is, how many here know that when you accepted Jesus Christ, where were you spiritually? You were broken. You ask God for help, come into my heart, right? You came to the end of yourself. When we realize daily that we can't do it without God, we're in the position of humility, and God now can take over. Are you with me on this? Okay? 
just a slight change, Satan puffs us up. I remember when I got a hold of the Word of God for the first time, I was a champion. And I let everybody else know about it. <laughs> Which is a form of pride. So we need to be able to filter and to submit ourselves to God in such a way so God can peel away any form of pride that tries to rise up. That's why God wants us to meet with him every day so that's dealt with. Can you say amen? That's why he wants you to take off your flesh, which has the pride in it, and lay it on the altar so he can pulverize it, neutralize it, press it, and you could put it back on without any repugnant or rep uh, repelling of the Holy Spirit. But guarantee, you go three days with no prayer, and your, your flesh will start rising up on its own, repelling the Holy Spirit. You want to know where troubles come from? Is when you step out in front of God and don't know it. And that's where the enemy can get in. Well, Pastor Curry, are you teaching us that we'll never have a problem as a Christian? Oh, for heaven's sakes. You jump from the fire, from the pan right into the fire. But what you might want to consider is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fire. And yet they came out not smelling like smoke. Not a burn part on them. Why? Because the Son of God was in there. There was four men in there. So what we need to realize is that that's who we are. The world is on fire full of sin and destruction. But there's souls to be saved. We're not supposed to be trying to maintain our victory. We're supposed to be so caught up in God that God leads us and we're getting the refugees out of the hands of Satan into the hands of the kingdom. Because people look at you and they go, what have you been doing, sister? You're glowing. All right, that's Luke 18. Also, we spoke, spoke a parable to some who trusted in themselves. There's the problem, okay? That they were righteous. Now, what was the Jewish situation? Why were the Jewish people given the Ten Commandments instead of instruction through the wilderness? Pride. Because they were doing it for God. You tell God, Moses, when you go up there, anything he asks us, we can do it. And that's why God gave the Ten Commandments. Because it faces pride and says you cannot save yourself. Okay, moving right along. People, lots of people don't know that, and so they need to hear it. So, that they were righteous and despised other. Listen, Satan does try to work on people to get people to despise other people. One of the things that God does not want you to do is despise and rail on people who are helpless. People that seem to always make the wrong choices. It doesn't do any good to rail on them. How about giving them the gospel and the alternative of the way out? Say amen. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. We have a tendency to rail on the world when what we need to do is just be humble. Can you say amen? And, or even as this tax collector, he's standing right here praying together, and he's pointing out to tax collector. What would that be a display of? Pride. Far from humility. All right? I love this note. All right. <clears throat> so he goes, I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off, out of humbleness and brokenness, would not so much 
raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which one is prideful? Which one is humble? Very simple, right? Every day, we humble ourselves by meeting with our God. When we rise up, first thing the enemy will do is have somebody call you a name or do something to try to call you out of that containment that you walk in. I call it God's bubble. You walk around in God's bubble. Remember the movie Bubble Boy? <laughs> Not quite like that. But you're, you're covered in a bubble. And people don't realize that. Think about it. For in him we live, we move, and we have our being. In him we live. We move. Yeah, but the other part of you is not in him. Can't get in him. That's why you have to throw it down on the altar daily. When your devotional time in the morning say, first thing I come to you is I want to come to you and tell you I love you, and I just take off my flesh in Jesus' name, and I lay it at your feet. Now, let's get started, God. <laughs> Hello? Do you really actually do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the Bible calls our body a separate entity from our spirit. So you, the spirit man, lay your body on the altar as a living sacrifice. Set apart and holy so God can use you. But if you don't do that, your flesh is going to be a weed. It's going to have a beacon on it. Say, get away from me. I'm evil. You know, we don't know. It's in the spirit. And so that's why when you're around certain people, you can feel vibes and stuff. Because you know what they're projecting. Good or you're projecting something else. Moving right along. So he says, I tell you that the man went down, the tax collector, to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, there's a false humility. Let me talk about this for a minute. Did you know there's false humility, which just is a form of pride? When you say, God, I'm so unworthy. I'm so unworthy. That's already a known fact. <laughs> but the fact that you're saying it all the time is a form of false humility. It's like you're trying to prove something that you're humble. So don't let your mind tell you, you stupid. You did a dumb thing again, dummy. If your mind talks to you like that, we already told you that that's not you. That's Satan using your words in your mind because of things that you heard in your past and he's replaying it to you. Hello? And so realize that, listen, every good and perfect gift comes from who? So if you've got an imperfect thought coming through there, you know it didn't come from God. Well, maybe it came from me. That's the lie Satan sells. You know, if you're just driving along and suddenly you get guys, you get this porno picture flies through your head. You didn't imagine that, but Satan's going to say, see, you're not all cleaned up yet. You're not all cleaned up yet. Guilt, 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 guilt. Says, no, that's not me. In fact, I don't want anything to do with that. Thank you, Lord. And man, you just deck him right there. But no. We hear something, we think it's us, we see the enemy talking to us in a negative fact, and then we dwell on it. We dwell on it. Hello. How about worry? Don't you worry about a thing. You're in the bubble with Jesus. <laughs> Since when did the enemy going to surprise you and God? Come on, laugh at me. When is the devil going to get ahead of God and trick him? Never. In fact, if we were listening to God a little bit more, he would tell us what the joke is before the jokester comes. That's what kind of relationship I desire for you to have. That's the kind of relationship God wants to give you. He has already set it up. And he says, come on. Come. Sit down with me. Let me teach you the way it is. Yoke up with me. I'm meek. I'm lowly. Let's get going. When you yoke up with somebody who's seasoned like God, 
Everything, every day, all the way, is going to be taught you throughout the day. Are you with me? So, he who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. A couple of points. Never forget there are two of us. Old man, new man. The new man was created. Christ Jesus has God dwelling in it because you're born again now. You're full of God. And your flesh, if it isn't kept cleansed, will rise up and give you trouble. And it isn't mostly the devil. It's us. The devil needs us to work against us. He doesn't have the key to your back room. We have to ooze something out for him to grab and whack us with it. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to hand the enemy my gun. <laughs> and that's what happens to us when we talk negative all the time. Moving right along. Two, being humble allows God to approach us and to feel at home about us so we can become friends. Say amen. Amen. Thirdly, a humble person approaches God by faith and becomes easier each time he approaches God. He's open to being teach, taught, excuse me, being teachable and being taught. He's open to be moldable and shaped. He is the potter and we are the clay. Amen. So, in God's presence, this is what I want you to get a, a picture of. In God's presence, that beautiful presence of God, where you weep and you cry and you're just with God. He's marinating you. <laughs> How many had some good, some good steak? I marinate some great steak, but that's just another way of cooking steak. God needs to marinate us, soften us. He needs for us to realize that the fruit of the Spirit is something we all have. Don't ask God, God, give me more love God says, get in my presence and I'll grow it up in you. See, the fruit of the Spirit is grown under the sun, S-O-N, not through life circumstances. Life circumstances can make you hard or can show you things. But how many know the school of hard knocks is not the best way to learn? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we go in and we meet God. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, temperance, goodness, and gentleness, and faith, all in the presence of God mature. So if you're like me, the first thing that I, I ask for is, Lord, I seem to really, really need some more patience. And it was real quiet, and God finally said to me, he says, son, I am patience. And if you spend time with me, I'll grow up in you. Son, I am love. And if you spend time with me, I'll grow up in you. You'll be so loving, somebody could spit on you and you could pray for them, they can be healed. But see, enemy doesn't want us to that exposure. He doesn't want us to be hanging around like God like that. After all, I got things to do at home. I got garbages to dump and I got all these things, my garden and all this, blah, 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 blah. No, God first. You want your garden to really grow? God first. You want your, you want your uh, finances, the promotion on God first. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. Amen? He lifts us up. So our best way to get promoted with God is to get down with the Lord seriously. Can you say amen? And of course, all of you are like that because you wouldn't be here. Amen. All right. And for those who couldn't quite make it, you're here too because you're watching. Amen. All right. So have you learned anything yet? Let's go to another point. The prideful and self-centered. Let's look at this. The prideful and self-centered. How many know that anyone could be prideful? Anyone could become self-centered. In fact, that's what Adam passed on to us. So go with me to Luke 14, 7 through 11. Another picture of the difference of pride and humility. Luke 14, verse 7. 
So he told the parable to those that were invited. When he noted how they chose, listen, how they chose the best places. One of the funniest things I used to do a long time ago, I don't do it anymore, is when we have a love feast or a potluck, I love to watch who steps in first. <laughs> Hello? Think about it. Now, there's nothing wrong with stepping in first. Somebody has to do it. Amen. But how many here know it's the last that is first and the first that is last? Remember the parable of the penny? It says there was a student farmer that went out into the marketplace. He needed workers for his field. So he went out and hired some workers for a penny a day. You say, whoa, you know, just never mind the amount, okay? And then he said it was enough. So he bent somewhere around 9 to 11 o'clock. He went to the market again, and he hired him for the rest of the day. He said, I'll pay you a penny if you just come on and help everybody for the rest of the day. And he found that that wasn't enough. God was really blessing him. And so he went down to the market again, and he says, look, I'll pay you a penny if you just come and help us finish off the harvest, Now, what ended up happening is the ones that were hired first complained, said, these people are all getting paid a penny. These people only work two hours, and these people work four hours, but we've worked 12 hours. And we're all getting paid a penny? See how the selfishness works? And he says, sir, I've done no wrong, for I came to you and asked you if it's all right for you to work this day for a penny, and you said yes. Why would you shame me then when I go ask another group for more and pay them the same amount? And why would you? What would cause that jealousy? What would cause that envy? Pride. Pride. Amen. How many times has Satan irritated you? Or maybe your girlfriend looks like she's looking at your best friend and pride rises up and you become jealous. You see how all that works. Satan works these little things. Not because we're so terrible a person. He just worked very hard to get it into mankind and get us to walk our flesh. So going back to religion really quickly, remember Peter, James, and John when he went up to the mountain? Jesus transformed before them. God showed up. And Peter, what did he say? It's good that we be here. Let's make three tabernacles. Religious people want to build something or do something to let God know how wonderful they are. That's okay, but it's religious. Can you say amen? What does God want from you? Just you to love him and and obey him. That's it. You're kidding me. That's pretty hard. Just to love him and to obey him. All right, so let's read on. So they sat at the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. You see, this is how nature is. This is how society is. But when you are invited, go sit down in the lowest place. So that when you're invited, you may have glory in the presence of the Lord of those who sit at the table with you. For, now listen again. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. What happened to Satan? He exalted himself, didn't he? What happened? God threw him right on back down. Amen. So I want to tell something that you might not know, maybe you know, but we already discovered that pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But pride is something that's in our flesh. Can you say amen? But, but what you need to know is the reason why God hates pride so much because Lucifer is the author of sin. And when he had pride against God, he sinned. So any child of God who displays pride is immediately dealt with in a loving manner, but you are immediately dealt with. 
I mean, there's other things. It's not like God winks at them. But when you start being in pride, you're going to hurt somebody. There's never been an argument where there's been humbleness. There's never been an over-opinion where there's humility. There's never, I'm right, you're wrong, ever comes up to those who walk in humility. Do you understand? That's why Satan could never rile Jesus up. Huh? Satan says, if you be the son of God, command your stones be made bread. He says that after he fasted 40 days, Dave. I mean, Satan doesn't wait. He waits till you're really under and then he'll come. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. Listen, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, right? But my words will not. Amen. So a couple of points underneath that. Humble ourselves. In this new life in Christ, we never should promote ourselves in anything. That's why I don't advertise. I told God this time, and God told me this time, that the only way people will come here is by word of mouth. Your word of mouth. You're not to sit me out on the street and I'm going to hold a sign, come to our little church. No. I had a huge church. I had a big church. Been all over. Traveling there and there, you know what? It was more problems than sometimes it's worth. You have to have a staff. You have to have people loyal. You have to have, that's not easy. And so a lot of the churches, they will just quit all of that and they will hire their staff so they can fire them on the spot if they mess up. <laughs> But big churches that come out, God raises up. Nobody's paid. Hello. But that's okay. God pays us. Can you say amen? So, as you understand, a church has to be unified in humility. Can you say amen? All right, let's look at a couple. Second thing. We are believers. We should honor to who, give honor to whom honor is due. Amen. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Go with me to James chapter 4, please. Six through eight. To the humble, he gives more grace. Everyone say grace. Now, let me just see, for example, how many here don't know what grace is? Anybody? Maybe you think you do, but you don't. Grace is, if I could say this, Everything God is. Everything God is. We have this tendency as humans to think grace over here and God gave grace. Grace over here and God gave grace. God is grace. And God so loved the world that he gave his only graceful son. You see. So, so, so it, say amen. Remember Paul? He was frustrated. If you read the account, Paul's thorn in the flesh. If you read the account, he went to God and he says, God, I can't handle it anymore. I'm paraphrasing. He went to God and says, take this. Lord, I can't handle it. I mean, you know, he's being persecuted. He's being stoned. People are shipwrecked. He's doing all this. He goes through the list in the chapter before. And he says, Lord, I can't handle all of this. And God, what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. Well, Paul heard the right thing. We hear the religious thing. Oh, just hang in there. My grace will work things out. How many used to think that? Grace is who? God is always working things out in you. Can you say amen? For it is God that works in you, that does his good will and pleasure. So don't think grace over here and God over here. Think them together. So God takes the humble and he gives them more of himself. Let me say it again. The humble get more of God because God feels more welcome to hang out. Not because God is respecter of persons. You see, when I was a sinner, God was right close to me. Did you know he was right out real close? All I needed to do is say, Jesus, come in my heart, forgive me, I sin. He went right on in. I could have been in a mine shop two miles on, underground and prayed that prayer. God is right up close. He came at Pentecost. So when we were sinners, 
We were a walking void. We were empty inside. And God is surrounding us. And the moment we heard the Gospels, a light went on. We go, well, maybe, maybe I need to ask Jesus to come in and forgive me. And as soon as we did, God went, boom, did he not? He didn't say, now, Linda, you wait for three days, and then I'll battle my way into the, into the earth and give you my salvation. That's Old Testament. Hello. New Testament, you and I are splashing in God. How many here remember the time when they were saying, I'm meddling now. Oh, there's coming a revival. Yes, it's a new wave of the Spirit. Yeah, well, be careful, the people that just coin a phrase. Folks, folks, think about it. We're not looking for a wave. You're swimming in the ocean of God. If you're looking for a wave... <laughs> Maybe you ought to get out of your head. Open your mouth, swallow some water. Hello. That's how the enemy has been working on the minds of people. Keeping you separated. That somehow, man, there's so much God ready for you. So much things he wants to show us. The scripture says that if we spend time with them, he will show us things to Come. Amen. The trouble is, we get to sitting down and our mind goes to 80 things that we should be doing. <laughs> oh, you forgot to call so and so and you forgot to do this. Get up from there. Just get up from there so you don't get a good dose of the Holy Ghost. Hello. Come on over here. Get that little job done. I got to the point where an enemy was doing that to me. I took in a tablet. And a pen. And as soon as he started harassing me about ideas, I just wrote them down. And then when I was done, God helped me do them. <laughs> Hello. Don't forget, you don't battle the, uh, the enemy in your mind. You love the Lord in your thoughts. And Satan puts him in his place. But the moment you take on, I mean, God used to, you should show me about myself. He says, son, you're sitting there dwelling on things you can't do anything about. And you're letting it occupy your thinking. And I have not only that, if you continue to let it go, you're going to get all upset about it. And this, you'll move out of the realm of the spirit and into the realm of yourself. And then what are you going to do? You're going to fight like somebody who beats the air. You're not shadow boxing. You're pulverizing using the word of God. Can you say amen? The sword of the spirit. I found my sword the other day. So I'm polishing it all up. And I'm going to show you what it's like when you see the sword of the spirit. And somebody coming at you to lob your head off, Satan. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? You with me? James 4. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Say, God, here I am. Take me. Resist the devil. Satan, you have no right. And he will flee from you. Why will Satan flee from you when you spend time with God? Can you tell me? Because you look like God when you get up. When you spend time with God, he clothes you. He fills you. He pulverizes your flesh. And then he says, all right, go out there. And play and f live. And Satan says, oh my gosh. God is going with them. I got to get them away from God. I got to get them away from God. Hey, hey, Uncle Lucifer. We got a real problem over here. Sherry's following Jesus. What do I do? What do I do? I can't do nothing. Got to wait till the person just gets into themselves. Okay, but I hate that. Hello. Let's go on. Philippians 2, please. Have the mind of a humble believer. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. Listen. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, made in God's image when he came down as a man, 
But yet he was God. Remember, he left his God up here and came down as a man anointed by God. All right? So don't forget that. Being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to even be considered equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of a man. And being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself. Hello. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because of this, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name, the name which is above every name. Not given him a name, the name. See the word the name? He's not a way, he is the way, the truth, the life. He's it, the grace, the patience, the power. Can you say amen? And you become like Elisha to Elijah, and you watch everything he does, you monitor everything he does, so it'll rub off on you. That's who you are. Now listen. So it says, given them the name which is above every name, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Not the name of Jehovah, not the name of Yahweh, not the name of Adonai, not all of these other wonderful names of God. But God says, I don't want you calling me by my name. I want you to use the name that's higher than every name that could be named. Jesus Christ. You notice nobody swears in Buddha. Oh, Buddha. Nobody says, kick their foot, Krishna, Krishna. It's GD this and GC this because Satan knows where the power is. It's about time the church does too. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God our Father. Guess who lives in you? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Jesus, the King. So when you rise up with the King, everything will be subject to the God who lives in you. So you're not trying to believe. You move right into trust. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. Did his disciples doubt? Yeah. I'm going to tell you, every one of you are going to the other side. There's not a devil in hell that will keep you from heaven now that you have Jesus in your heart. And what's really neat, because you remember the time when, when Jesus was sitting and praying, and they got in the boat, and God says, go to the other side, and then they're right in the middle of the storm, and they started crying out, Jesus had to get up from prayer and walk on the water and rescue him, right? That's Old Testament. See, God is not in the boat. In the New Testament, Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they went on across the other side again. But this time, Jesus was in the boat. New Testament. You see, we're going to heaven. We're going to go through this life. Now, you can either go with Jesus in your boat, or you can go fearful. Which one will you choose to go? Who's in your boat? Who do you promote? What causes your boat to float? Moving right along. <laughs> Are you guys all right? Man, I look at your face. There's some really, really good things in the Word of God for us, isn't there? Amen. So let's catch this. Okay. Every tongue shall confess. So our Father will exalt a humble person, a humble child of God, and promote them. Look at Job, chapter 1 and chapter 2. When Satan came in to accuse Job, God bragged on him. God did not say Job is a turkey. He's disobedient. He went and married a worldly wife that taught the kids how to party hardy. No, God didn't say, he said, you consider my servant Job, there's none like him in all the world. That's how Father looks at you. 
There's only one of you, and you're the best there is. Why? Because you were purposed and planned to be his child. Man, I tell you what, Satan just knows he can get to the father by messing with his kids. So don't get messed with. Well, how do I do that? Follow exactly the instructions God gives us from his word. That's how. Not your opinion, not you hope so. Do it. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer's only. Okay, so our Father will exalt the humble. Once we realize there is nowhere else to go for you and I, we must humble ourselves and allow God to promote us. Thirdly, God will not tolerate anyone who has pride because pride destroys. Satan is the example. Are you with me? To attack a child of God is to attack God. And if you say, God, I'm being attacked. I don't know what from or what. I'm just going to submit to you. God will stand up and crush whoever's doing it. I remember when I first got into the ministry and God showed me there was a satanic covenant that got warned about us. My bus driver that picked us up from Prairie Ridge, where I was raised, used to drive us to high school. Then I got saved. And one of the bus driver's daughters, who also is a bus driver, says she was hearing this guy talk on the bus about our church and how they were going to curse us and they were going to put curses on us and they were going to like do all kinds of crazy things and, and all that. And so when she told me, I laughed. We had a little Bible study up in Buckley at a place called Ipset Creek. It's right, up, right by Rainier State School, up in the woods a little bit by the power lines. We baptized probably 100 people in the stream there. But we had a meeting going on. And this local covenant witch, a head of a local witch, brought her and her chalice people they fill with spooks, in to start infiltrating our church. You'll say, wow, that sounds real Star wars -y. Why can we be religious and be so blinded to what the enemy wants to do? Don't be blind, be alert. God's alerting us. So anyway, God said to me, he says, son, this lady's going to come in, she's going to act like a Christian, she's going to talk like a Christian, but she's going to seduce all of these young, young kids. I just said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to bind it up and rebuke it. And I want you to look her in the eyes and tell her, you spirit from hell, you either change or you will die. And so she came in that time, and I told her that very thing. Now, at that time, she had her chalice with her, which is an individual so drugged up, they put spirits in them. I know I'm talking Star Wars. So they bring him in, they sit him in a church, and while the preaching's going on, they flick the spirits out of there, like out of a glass, to get the congregation to not listen. The babies cry at once. And so when I did, walked up to her and I said, I know what you're doing, I know why he's here, and I rebuke you, you spirit from hell, and if you don't change, you're going to die. She screamed. I mean, we're talking about my dad's an elder. I, we had a whole packed church and screaming out of there. Listen, the devil's afraid of you knowing who you are. As long as we're ignorant, we're slaves. As long as we're informed, read the scripture, we're free men, free women. Can you say amen? And we don't have to be concerned what the enemy does. I can tell you stories when we were down in Tahiti where we had a whole... We would do huge prayer lines, and half of them would be filled with demons. <laughs> I'd love to take you down and get some Star Wars effect, you know. I tell you what, it's a great way to mature is on the mission field. Go down for a few days and check it all out. But anyway, let's go on past this. We need to do what the Word says. Can you say amen? Now, let's look at it. The Word of God is what? Come on, you Christian. The word of God is God, and God is the word. Scripture, in the beginning was the word. The word is with God, and the word was God. 
Remember the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, until Jesus came to be born in the flesh, then he became the begotten of the Father. Okay? Because if you think about it, how long was Jesus God? Forever. You don't see Jesus being born in heaven somewhere, but the mother, father, God, getting baby gods. <laughs> so for him to strip himself and come down into the earth and be born as a man, he humbled himself. And he did that for you and I. How dare we say, Jesus, I'm not ready to come to you. How dare we say, God, I'm too busy. I'll go to church once in a while. How dare we start making plans without asking God's involvement? After all, he protects us and watches over us. Now, again, when I talk like that, immediately the devil says, see, he's pointing you out. Listen, the devil comes to church and he sits right there. And he goes blah, 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 to me all the time I'm preaching. It's great exercise. He encourages me to really let him have it. Hello. Amen. Okay. Let's look at what the scripture said and we'll finish up. All right. Now, what does the word say for us? What should we be doing with God's help? 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 through 9 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit, subject yourself to your elders. That takes humility. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another. In other words, humble people listen and love and they pray for one another. And be clothed with humility. Notice it says clothed with humility. Where do the clothing go on you? Your flesh. So you go into there and you say, God, clothe me with you. That I walk in humility. You see how it works? Because the humble one lives in you. Lord, clothe me this time. Why do you wear clothing? If you don't know this one, we're going to pray for you. To cover up your flesh. Someone says, your nakedness. Well, you know, listen, you can show your nakedness with your clothes on. Hello. Depending on how you dress and how you project things. Amen. The intent of what you do and what you say is known by those to spend time with God. They can pick up what you're intending way before you know what you're intending. Amen. That's why I love being a pastor is immediately I can pick up on things. Why would God do that with you, Pastor Gary? Because I have a flock I'm accountable for. And if I can't take good care of you, I'm going to have to answer for that. All right. So it says, so be submissive one to another, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Look at verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care over on him. Listen, what does the word care mean? Anxiety and worry. You take care, brother. <laughs> now, that's not what we mean, okay? But the word care, if you use it in the scripture, and the cares of this life, and deceitfulness, and the lust of other things, enter and choke the word. Okay, so you see the word care, casting all of your what? Cares upon who? God, okay. For example, something good is happening. Kids are starting to come. They're going to church. Things are coming together. And immediately you get this thought like, I, want, I wonder what's going to go wrong. That's a care. Don't, don't pile condemn, condemnation. I, that's a care. When you hear it, your mind pick up something like that, don't talk it. If you get a little worry thought in there, the worst thing you could do is talk it. Because a thought will die unborn, unspoken. If you don't speak negative thoughts, they will die unborn. So if you have a negative thought that says, worry, 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 kind of, I'm afraid of this, don't speak that. Well, why, Pastor Gary? 
Because even though the devil's not always around, once in a while, he'll pick up on the negativity. And I'll leave you with this, and then we'll read that. There are several ways Satan picks up on our negativity. Number one, our countenance. You're supposed to shine like a bright light. When you don't shine, you got something on your mind. And that triggers the enemy eventually. Negative speaking creates a stench. You get around people that are heavily into the handouts and the welfare and all that kind of stuff. You listen to them talk. Not all, but some. They're so negative and they're talking, they'll never get out of their problem. Unless they act on the word, you see. And the devil can smell you. Hello. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians, that you produce an aroma of good things when you're in faith with God, but you produce aroma of death because if you're not praying, your flesh oozes it. You're dying. Not you spiritually, but your flesh is getting older. One day we're going to shed this, Dave. Hallelujah! Graduation day! No big deal. You see, we put too much weight and thought on our life here. And we need to put enough weight and thought to get with God so we can have a good life here. But good comes from God. Not from doing right or wrong. Because I was doing great things for God, I thought. But stuff was still going wrong. So I went to God about it. And he says, you're doing it for me. And you're doing it with a noble heart. But would you please back off, sit down, and let me do it? <laughs> Thank you, God. Appreciate the word. Amen. All right, finishing with you. But instead, be sober, be vigilant, sound-minded. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking whom he may devour. As a roaring lion, he isn't a roaring lion. Walk upon the lion and the adder. You trample under your feet. Therefore, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are upon everyone. Everyone has to learn to walk with God. Hello. I can tell you until I'm blue in the face or pink. But to walk with God, it's you and God work out that salvation so God can help you because you have special little niches and personality things that are so wonderful. So therefore, God wants to be personal in that relationship. Let me, if I could just, if I could just cry and beg you to start your day off with God and stay long enough for him to saturate you, you would thank me for eternity. Okay? It's the only thing that straightened out my life. Because I knew the word. I knew how to run churches, do businesses, all of that. But without God, it's just noise. But with God, it becomes successful. And so Psalms 25, 9, you know what it says? Here's a good one. I love this. It says, the humble, he guides in justice. And the humble, he teaches his way. Psalms 146, verse 4. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify them with humility of their salvation. Wow. Proverbs 11, 2. Where pride comes, there is shame. But with the humble, wisdom. And then Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain him. Are ready? You want to pray a prayer? Let's ask God to work with us, shall we? Amen. So, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, teach me how to be humble and to walk in your way. Teach me to see beyond the effects around me. I don't want to judge by my eyes. I don't want to judge by my ears. But I want to judge righteously by your spirit. Help me to be humble. Help me to resist pride and to give me a check as soon as I am getting too much into myself so I can walk humbly before you. And you will exalt me in due time. In Jesus' name.
And if you agreed, say amen. Give the Lord a praise, will you? Amen.